You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skavitsky. Now Trending is back with another episode on Autism Weekly, and Dr. Robbie El Fatal is our guest. We want to talk about current issues affecting the autism community and various solutions being undertaken to improve accessibility for everyone. Robbie is the founder and CEO at Maraca Learning, a clinician-led autism therapy provider headquartered in Boise, Idaho, as well as a PhD BCBA. Today, we're going to discuss ASCENT in ABA therapy. ASCENT is the acknowledgement uh, to willingly participate given by the client, especially when the client is under the age of 18. This has a lot of rumbling within our field, and there's a lot to tease out with this concept. And Robbie, I'm excited to chat with you about this. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. It's uh, it's good to be with you. I always enjoy our conversations. Awesome. Well, I, Robbie, I, I think that the first thing that we probably need to tease into between you and I is discussing, you know, what is a scent? This is a, it shouldn't necessarily be a new term, but it is for a lot of people within our field. And the concept of applying it to ABA is a whole nother component. But when you think of a scent, what is it that, that you're pulling out of it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you, when you asked me that question and, and first when you, recommended that we we have this conversation jeff i was i was thinking more uh i just like went way back my experiences and i thought i thought through like my experiences in the classroom and my experiences in private practice and and when i think of ascent i think of like learners that are just like joyfully engaging in their therapeutic environments, right? Like you've got, we 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 all know what uh, the treatment uh, treatment setting looks like in, in most cases. Um, and you've got, you know, you've got your BCBA and your RBT that's directly implementing the treatment plan. And then you've got the learner. And so when I think of ASCEN, I think of learners that are really enjoying treatment and excited to be participating in, in what's happening around them as opposed to being like forced into doing things that, um, either they're not wanting to do or they're not feeling like doing it. And um, so, I, you know, in, in in response to your question, I think like that's what comes to mind when when I think of assent. Yeah. So, I mean, different from the idea of consent, which we all know is kind of that legal component to it. Right. Because I think I think I agree with you is that, I mean, assent is is the desire to be a part of that environment. Um, right. Right. The, the problem that I keep sorting through is going to be times where there's a part of that learning experience where it's like, you know, I don't want to do this. And maybe it's right. still necessary. And maybe we can take this back to like a, a neurotypical child or even one of our own children and put it into that perspective. Is that have you've run into probably where, you know, your, your child doesn't want to do their homework. They want to go out and play instead. And they, you don't want them falling behind as a parent. You don't want them missing out on what they need to do versus what they want to do. Right. How how do you how do you compare the idea of ascent in that process as a parent? Are you saying, yeah, go go play, go do whatever you want? Yeah. Or I mean, how do you how do you manage that before we get into with the autistic community that maybe we're we're working with as learners and clients? Yeah, I, I love that question because these are the very practical nuts and bolts of this issue of ascent. So when I think of like my role as CEO leading a team of clinicians that are very well intentioned and bright, it's like these are the exact issues that come up. It's like, what do I do when? Like, let's 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 stop. Like, you know, we could be very like theoretical and, and conceptual, but like, let's get down nuts and bolts in the clinic or at home. What do we do when? And so that's your question reminds me of this. So I had the I had the chance to to connect with uh, Michael Fabrizio, who is you know he's he's an expert in ascent, and um, there's a it seems like there's a, a a group of of individuals 
in our field who really like who've been doing this for a lot longer than than many of us have, um, or at least consciously, like they're aware that they're doing this. And so my my question, like my question or my my response to your question, Jeff, is like, well, so in that moment, let's say one of my kids says, uh, "Hey, Dad, I'd rather not do this homework." I think like the the traditional approach is like, okay, well, you're going to do it because it's homework and you got to get it done. And I've got five kids, right? So I run, a, I have to run a tight ship. Um, but I think what I'm learning is like, okay, so if one of my kids says, dad, I'm not feeling like doing this right now, or I'm, or just like for whatever reason, they're just not interested in doing it. Then I think from like an ascent based practices perspective as a parent, I would I would need to be thinking like, OK, well, what about the learning environment do I need to change to get my my kid more interested in in doing their homework? So it's like it's like in that moment, I'm, I'm sort of like losing the battle. And I hate to use that word because it sounds, you know, it's like it's it's not the most um, friendly word. Right. But it's like I'm losing the battle. But if I'm being a good parent and, you know, analog for good behavior analyst, it's like, well, what do we need to do to get you know, Andrew or Timothy or Genevieve or Juliana or Leo, those are my kids. What do I need to do to get these these kiddos like doing their homework? So I think like in the moment you you, you need to you know, like you need to respect to an extent um, a set withdraw and a set withdraw should then have stimulus control over your behavior as a behavior analyst and like, OK, so what do I do now? Um, so I think that's the that's my response to your question. I don't know if I re, I don't know if I answered well. Yeah, and by I, the way, Jeff, you and I can both acknowledge on this, like right here. This is like base camp for us. Like we're climbing a mountain, and this is the very beginning. Like we don't really like I don't have all the answers, and so mm -hmm. I still feel like I'm like wrestling through these concepts with. So I want to approach this subject with the utmost humility and like vulnerability. I don't have all the answers. I'm learning just like everyone else. Yeah, and and that's the I think that's the same perspective that I'm walking into. It is is there's the information's been out there. It is you should be respecting, providing dignity, recognizing somebody's discomfort, and modifying what's occurring. But there's also been a huge societal change over the last four or five years, which has broadened our thought of what does it mean to do this appropriately. It's challenged us to think outside of the box. Um, but the way that you you put that into perspective, it's it is good parenting. It is good clinical work to recognize and almost empower the voice of somebody saying, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I'm not feeling as if I have the ability at the moment to be able to process through this. Um, but that comes out in so many different ways. Yeah. The, the challenge that I have is how do you make that change back? How do you modify the environment without coercion if you're trying to do that in a timely manner? So in treatment, we might have months to establish rapport, trust, everything that goes on with that in our daily life and with with our children at, at school. And I'm just going to put it back into that context right now, because I think it's sometimes easier to talk about in a broader nature, yeah. is if I don't help them to be able to access the material that they're doing, is that they're, they're slowly missing out on all of the, and I'm going to use schoolwork, all the educational material that they need to be caught up on. So am I inherently creating a gap while I'm building a skill? And is that something that is worth it? Is it worth building the skill to create a temporary gap? And those are the questions that kind of go through my head constantly. Yeah, yeah. I think that you you have to you have to stop and think like, you know, um, as I was just reflecting on this subject i i for some reason i just kept thinking about my classroom environment and uh i would have learners that would just like our students that would just choose not to do something right and and i would tell my staff you know in this moment this is partially why i use that that word battle it's like i would tell my staff 
in this moment, we're losing the battle, but let's not win the war. Because escape maintained behavior is like it's it's going to get reinforced. Like the learner or the student decides not to do the task at the table or not to do whatever it is that you ask them to. It's like no matter what, in a lot of ways, that's getting reinforced, right? Like I, there there are times where I just I like I cannot physically get this kid to do the thing, right? So it's like it's getting reinforced. That behavior is getting reinforced anyways. So I think that like in that moment, Jeff, it's like that's not working. So no matter what, it's not working. And I do think that it does call for quick pivots. And um, and I think that if if you can go into if if you have the time to to design uh, to design like the 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 response or the the appropriate responses um, in in the moment, right? Like I think you could you could you could make good progress. But I get what you're saying that it's like well sometimes we don't have a lot of time. And I think that in those moments when things go wrong, yes, you might fall behind. But I think what you want to do then is like what can I do in the future? Like when tomorrow rolls around and it's tomorrow afternoon and we're doing homework, like what can I do differently to get the, to get the result that I know is, is not just the result that I want, but it's good for the, good for my child, right? Like they, they need to do their homework. So I, I think it's tough, man. Like this is, this is a lot of that, that, that like healthy tension that I think this subject brings uh, to, to people like us where we're just trying to figure it out. Yeah. And, and, and to kind of bring it back full circle, I agree with everything that, that you just articulated there. Uh, but I think that these are these are the conscious sort of conversations that are being had right now. And we're deliberating through it. When you look at historically within the ABA community and you even look at the education we've received, assent is a very small piece. The, the idea of noncompliance as a skill set is just it's foreign um yeah. we break it down we use terms i mean we change it functional communication training we look at and i i'm going to use the term tolerance but it's kind of you know is that really the way that we want to look at it we spend a lot of time on extinction but we don't spend equally as much time on modifying the environment the variables in the environment tracking all these yes. precursors and that's new to yes. where our focus has been yes what what do you think we need to be doing in our education of bcbas right now because we can't do this we can't trickle this down to rbts we can't trickle this down to uh direct line staff if we ourselves are not taking the time to focus on the training and the education to be able to to put it into play and understand the nuance so where do we start right. with something like this yeah you're 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 alluding to this idea that like um i i went into our center recently and i did an observation i was there for two or three hours and i just sat you know sat sat on the floor and just observed our bcbas doing what they do best and observed our rbts being superstars and observed our little learners doing their thing and it was wonderful it was delightful it was magical i loved it i loved every moment of it and i thought to myself like this environment the word that came to mind it's like it's magical like it's beautiful and i was so excited to see it and i think that's what we want to create right we want to create these environments where learners want to do the things that you're doing because you're so exciting and i think of my own training and 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 like i learned these things from a very early stage it wasn't explicit it wasn't like you know we're teaching you a scent rob it was like, no, 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 make therapy fun and natural and generalizable. Like the kids should be so excited to do the things that you're trying to, to, to teach them. And, and so like, that's the environment that we need. And how do we get there? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, we, we need to build new cultural practices that, uh, that enable us to do this uh, at the at the central level, right? But it really starts at like the organizational level and the process level. So you really got to make sure that as you're designing and, and developing these um, like these organizational initiatives or interventions that uh, that you're really like you're you're touching on all levels of the organization because it does require alignment, it requires a lot of training. But it's not just training, right? Like you can train people to do this, but then there's you know that antecedent-based intervention. There's got to be consequence-based intervention. You got to coach staff, um, and so I think it's like it's it, there's some there's some like there's some heavy work to do here. Um, but I think that like first step is, do we want to do this work? And I think most of us would agree like, yeah, we do. We actually do want our learners in our, you know, in our learning environments, whatever that is, whether it's a clinic or home or 
or a, a school like we do want our learners to like willingly do the things that that we're trying to teach them because it's good for them right to the extent that it is good for them yeah uh, that's a Another that's another issue. But uh, yeah, man, like I, I again, I just think like this is a really important topic or subject. And I think that we're like we're at base camp. We've got a lot of climbing to do. We got a lot of work to do. Others are a lot farther ahead than people like me. And so I'm just like learning as much as I can. And again, like I'll be the first one to say I do not have all the answers, but like I'm working as hard and as fast as I can to get to get as much information as I can. Um, yeah. So. No. And when when I think about it, and, and you use the term base camp, but when I think of kind of you know as a field where we currently stand, and if I were to throw out some of these these non ascent behaviors like mm -hmm. um, flopping to the ground, throwing materials off a table, yeah, um, yeah. crying, whining, yeah. uh, moving away from the clinician, saying no, or asking to stop. And I were to pull a large majority of behavior analysts, they're going to be looking at the, the function of the behavior through a lens of how can they immediately make a change to it with more of a consequence strategy than an antecedent strategy. So their inclination is going to be, okay, well, I need to do escape extinction. I'm going to sit behind the child so they can't get up and run away. I'm going to not attend to the whining behavior and only reinforce when they actually make a pencil mark on the paper or put a piece of puzzle in there. And so they're going to reinforce what they're looking for. But at that same time, they didn't recognize this is the same way that my child might be trying to say, hey, dad, I can't do this right now. Like, I'm just yeah. I'm not in the right space where with that response, I might say, yeah, you know what? Sure, Adeline, or sure, kids. You know, you guys, I'll give you 15 minutes. I'll give you 20 minutes. Let's figure out a different way. And then I reapproach it completely different. I change what I'm doing to be able to make it more palatable. But we don't do right. that right now. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, Jeff, let me let me comment on that. So I think what you're saying is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to produce and cultivate environments where we're teaching learners to negotiate and to also advocate for themselves. And I think that's really important, like to the extent that a learner can, like we want them to be able to. I learned negotiation way back when I was like a young behavior tech Um AP taught me this, like, hey, it's really, it's really a, a valuable skill when you can teach your learners to negotiate. And so I think that's what we're essentially trying to do. And and honestly, like the way you just described and like, okay, escape extinction. Well, the best available evidence, I think I'd have to do like, I'd have to do a deep dive of the literature and I, and I haven't done it in relation to like this thought, but the best available evidence has led us to this point, I think. So I'm not like, this is not about shame or guilt or, you know, you shouldn't feel bad about what you've done because we all have stories of things that we've done that it's like, oh man, like I really wish I didn't do that. Um, but all that to say, it's like, I think that we were here and now we just need to figure out where we go. Yeah, and I mean, you hit on a lot of those. I mean, you you talked about, you know, let's collect data on some of the aversive events and understand what's triggering these things. You you mentioned is that establishing rapport, making it fun, making it motivating, um, utilizing the natural environment. But there's also training that needs to be really heavily put into play as functional communication is not new to our field. Yeah. I mean, this is something that has a lot of value to it, but it's understanding how to use it within the terms of assent and how to reinforce functional communication when it is escape maintained and what that actually means and how to do it. Um, yeah. So how, how important right now is it that leaders in our field are taking this step back to reevaluate and doing it conscientiously? Because I, I would think a wholesale change could absolutely cause havoc to a variety of our learners. It could throw off the ability for behavior technicians to do their job effectively or efficiently if they're not getting that information. So what do we need to yeah. be doing to be able to kind of promote this? Yeah, I think what I think we lead with example, you know, lead by example. I think leaders and organizations need to um, need to be relatively like involved in is issues related to ascent based practices. I think that leaders need to commit to ascent based practices as um, as uh, like 
you know, as a as a priority uh, in 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 their practice. If it is, again, like I think everyone has their own perspectives, and this like I, I really hope that we 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 as a as a field do not approach this subject in a divisive way. Like I don't I don't feel like there should be camps per se, because I think we can all agree that we want environments where kids can thrive and and flourish. Um, so I do think it's important, but I think it's important that we do it really strategically and intentionally, like it shouldn't be done willy nilly, because I get what you're saying. Like I do feel this tension that if, if people get the wrong impression or we're not communicating completely and we're not training um, extensively, that this could get very, it could get very confusing, right? And so, um, I, but I do believe like there's one thing that I, I feel very strongly about and I, 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 I'll say it. I think that ascent-based practices or an organization that that really does do their best to take into account learner, you know, the learner's ascent to participate in the therapeutic environment. I think that those are the practices that are going to get selected for in the natural in environment. Like I think families want that. Like if you walk into a center and you see a bunch of cubicles with kids in a in corners being forced to do things like that just doesn't feel right. Jeff, you and I both have kids. We don't want our kids in an environment like that. We want our kids in an environment where like they're, they're, it just, you know, again, we could talk about this all day, every day. And I, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to go on and on, but like, we know what we want as parents. And I think that that's what we need to create to the extent that we can um, in our, in our centers or in our home-based environments, wherever we're doing the work that we do. Yeah, and and I think that the research has to has to continue to evolve within this as well. Is that um, yes. we're we're always on this double edged sword? Is that you have a treatment timeline that is that's a, unfortunately there, oftentimes not under the control over at least financially um, within the clinician's realm. Is that you know you have other people that are involved, whether that's a payer who's saying, you know, you didn't make enough progress over the last four months. And it's like, well, what yeah. we were establishing were different skills. We were trying to teach yeah. the ability for somebody to be a part of a learning environment. So you might see pace of learning go down, which could affect how others are perceiving the care, which means we need to advocate differently. We need to clarify yeah. differently and the research needs yeah. to support that. But then there's also the safety issues. Like if we go in to every situation with the same thought process, the same level of ascent where it's like, okay, well, I have a safety thing and my child now is running into a street. Yeah. Okay, well, I can learn from that, change things around the next day, make sure my environment is more conducive. But at that moment, yeah, the last thing I'm going to do is allow them to run into the street. So I need to yeah. block that behavior to keep yeah. them safe. And it's trying to understand the nuances to this and how the so science blends. Um, are there other examples that you could think of as far as like, you know, there, there are things we just haven't thought of yet that we need yeah. to kind of continue to pursue to understand how it fits within that model? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that it's it's like we're trying to take a very humanistic approach. Like we wanna we wanna create these environments where where you know the the people we're entrusted to serve are 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 thriving. Um and so I, I think what your question reminds me of like the importance of uh client preferences and values and context. So every, like, I think every situation is a little bit different. I think you want to take that into account, but yeah, there, are, I'm sure there are numerous, um, you know, I, I'll say though, that what's, what's priority number one, like one of the most important reasons why you move to, you know, utilizing ascent based practices, one of the, the, significant priorities in that in that movement is safety right so like absolutely we need to keep the kids safe and and so uh, i'm sure that there are other examples of this but uh yeah there's it, to your point also like we we're out here practicing right like kids aren't waiting for research to catch up with uh, what we're doing they're they're showing up every day thankfully and we're excited for that um so we we do have a lot of work to do yeah, and and I think the other concept that oftentimes is put out there right now is that our treatment is is to be generalizable. It's to be put into public settings. Yeah. Therefore, it's got to be tele 
visible as well. Like the That's televisibility right. of our field is important. It's got to be seen as, you know, I'm not hiding what I'm yeah. doing. I know. Is that I'm not I'm not uh, creating these extreme situations that I can only do behind closed doors. It's I know. I've got to immerse everything I'm doing into an environment where you know everybody should feel comfortable with what's occurring. So when I think of ascent and I think of ascent-based interventions, I'd also be thinking, is this something that I would be doing with my child? Is this something I'd be doing if my friend were to ask me to, to help their and support their child and they were there with me? So it's putting it into the context of, I shouldn't be treating somebody differently necessarily because they're neurotypical or that they're neurodiverse. It's trying to figure out how to empower them utilizing similar skill sets. Um, yeah. And I think it's hard, uh, but it's agree. always it's taken hard. that step to, to put that into our decision-making process. Um, well, I, I think that this this whole concept is so, it's so big, so evolved, but one thing we never actually hit on is what is sent actually does like, I mean, yeah. we talked about, you know, what it means to not give a sense, but I mean, what should practitioners be looking for right now in the field as they're trying to work with kids? How do we know we're doing it right when our, when our clients or our learners aren't able to vocalize that all the time? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, I think that the work that Greg Hanley has done and, and others, you know, you mentioned televisability, that is important. We, we think that it's, uh, we want to be proud of the work that we're doing. And I know this, like, I'm, I'm, I'm risking my, you know, uh, I don't want to sound overly non-scientific, but it's like, man, I want to do what we do in good conscience. That's like my heart and mind leading me to do day in and day out what I think is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, you know, and, and yes, we're, we're, we're scientist practitioners and we love the science of, of, of behavior change. And we know how effective it can be when, when done right. But uh, we also want to make sure that we're looking for things like uh, like HRE, like are the learners willingly participating and excited? I think of all those kids that I had just the honor and joy of teaching way back when, and you just knew when kids were so excited to sit down at the table at the cube chair to do the thing or to go on the walk to identify what was on the bulletin boards in the hallways or whatever it was. It's like, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for kids that just seem excited about what you're doing. And, uh, and, and when that's not happening, I think we just need to, we need to um, sort of drop anchor a bit and just reevaluate. Like if we're being, if we're being analysts, and we're not we're not overly robotic and we're not thinking you know so far ahead that we're not taking into account what the learner is doing right then and there it's like this is this is what good aba looks like it's like what is what is happening in that moment what are the data telling us what do we need to do next taking into account where we are and where we want to go and i think that's what good behavior analysts do so i think what you're looking for is hre and um, this this willingness to cooperate and participate because it's reinforcing man like i i learned early on and again i i, I attribute a lot of my success to to those at autism partnership but it's like reinforcement is the cornerstone i think it's in the, it's in their work in progress book reinforcement is the cornerstone to any behavior change program and i just learned that if i can find a way to motivate learners to do the things that we want to teach them that are good for them that help them to thrive and flourish as little people then good things will happen and that's ha that that happens almost in every case mm -hmm. so i think it's really important like that's what i'm looking for if i if i had to answer your question being kind of a novice in a scent like that's what i'm looking for yeah and I, I would imagine that it's just continuously evolving our tools uh, evolving our preference assessment reinforcer surveys to also look at ascent and you know every every child is going to be we're going to define it differently every child is going to express ascent in different ways it could be smiling it could be physical engagement it could be visually being more engaged uh, statements of affirmation i mean a variety of things yeah. Yeah. But if we start tracking some of that instead of just the maladaptive behaviors, that's going to educate us on treatment effectiveness and it's going to educate us on learner style more than almost anything else. If we can just follow those trends and utilize them as a tool in our own belt in the teaching process. So I, I like the idea of the data scientist, but actually kind of taking a step back and realizing that it's all the data 
can be used, we got to use it appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I actually was listening to this podcast on data. Uh, Adam Grant was doing, uh, he had an interview with, uh, with a data scientist and it was a really interesting podcast episode. If, if, if anyone listens to his podcast, I strongly recommend, um, that episode. I think it just released recently on, on what not to do with data. So I'll just leave it there. That's a bit of a cliffhanger, but it's, it's a good episode for sure. <laughs> Well, I definitely, I, I, you know, good data and making it actionable is probably the way that we're all looking at it. But um, I think I, I know for me is that I need to continue to explore this issue. I need to figure out also how to effectively train on it. Um, and I and I need to understand the nuance. And um, these are things when you're looking at a variety of clients that all have different skill sets, different goals, different ambitions. Um, different ways of engaging the world around them is that I think that this is a very, very difficult, challenging thing, but it's not one we should shy away from. And uh, one of the things I look forward to doing on a future podcast is being able to look at this with extreme aggressive behaviors, because I have a feeling it's a different lens, but maybe not completely. There's got to be pieces of both worlds to be looking at there. So yeah, um, yeah. I appreciate you coming and, and chatting about this today, Rob. I, I, I tell you, every time we sit down to talk, I feel like it, it just makes my brain go in 8 billion different ways to say, all right, we need to start looking at different things, different ways and really explore it because there are a lot of people that rely on this knowledge trickling down. And if yeah. we don't give ourselves time, I think it makes it a lot harder for everybody that's working and trying to implement these plans to do their best. Yeah, I think, you know, like any good, uh, like any good podcast or research or whatever it is, like it, it's, it's sometimes helpful to create more questions and answers. Perhaps we did that here, I'm not sure, but um, I think what what we're also encouraging everyone to do is just to continue to be um, like lean into your teams. There, every every you know every one of us hopefully has great teams that we can rely on. I know that I do. I've got you know there there are seven of us behavior analysts and on on our team, and they're all really bright. Um, and so these are things that uh, yeah we we address them as a field to the extent that we can in the literature, um, and then also just you know, within, within our teams so that we can do better and, and uh, yeah, get to the point where we're, we're, where we're much more confident about the, the treatment that we're providing uh, to our, to our learners. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned a couple of the, uh, the resources that are out there yeah. and some people that are doing some yeah. of the good work. Do you mind, do you mind sharing that one more time? Just so families I, and providers I'll, can kind of get it. Yep, I'll send, I'll, I'll email you the information that I have, but um, Michael Fabrizio, I think they're doing an Ascent, an Ascent Con, like it's a conference on Ascent. I think it's in March, um, so I'll email you the details for that. Um, I think that could be a really great opportunity. I just had the pleasure of talking with Michael and it was a good conversation. He, he really helped me to think, um, think about this subject in uh in a maybe not in a different way but in a much more like evolved way right like i'm i'm just continuing to learn as much as i can on this subject so that i can help my team um and uh so yeah i'll i'll send those i'll send those resources over to you i know that there there's a lot of other resources also if you search ascent there's on google or on youtube there's a handful of resources that could be worth um uh checking out for sure Absolutely. And I think that there's more and more uh, continued education opportunity for providers that are that are tackling this just because it's starting to make a little bit more of a wave within the field, which is great because it gets people yeah. talking through their current practice and understanding where can it evolve. So but thanks so much, Rob. I, I And I look forward to doing this again and uh, can't yeah. can't wait to figure out what's next on the agenda. It feels like in our field, yeah. there's always something coming up and something new. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, Jeff, it's always a good time to talk to you. We got to talk yesterday about something different and here we are again <laughs> today. So it's always uh, it's always good to, to spend time with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments 
and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly Podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week. Thank you.